Thank you all for being here with us. Um, so the federal government does have a serious spending problem, as do, as do state governments, truly uh, trying to be all things to all people. Um, even just hearing today, it sounds like he wants the government to get into the battery business. Um, we, um, we don't so much have a, a revenue problem. Uh, according to CBO projections, the federal government's revenue will total $46 trillion over the next 10 years. Revenues will grow by 63%, about a 6% range. Very healthy. That's, that's, uh, and, and last year, our revenues grew about 7%, and that's after the, uh, uh, the Tax uh, Act, which had extraordinary um, results. So, but however, uh, mandatory spending over the next 10 years is projected to increase by 3.1 trillion uh, to 5.3 trillion, a total of 36.5 trillion over over a 10-year period, almost as much as it will be total as much as as uh, as revenues. Um, so, without even discretionary, which will grow by, by um, uh, 14 trillion dollars, we. Um, uh, we, we've already used up, just in mandatory spending, um, all, all the uh, revenue growth. So, so clearly uh, we, uh, we have a, uh, a spending problem, uh, and that would put us in the neighborhood of a $10 trillion, you know, 36 plus 14, uh, a deficit or debt uh, in addition to where we currently are. So, um, and this would, would lead to 79% of G GDP today to 144% in, uh, w within a 10-year period. So the way I look at it is we have two budgets. We have discretionary and we have mandatory uh, budgets. Discretionary spending is up $70 billion in 2018. Revenues, however, are also up $70 billion. So just looking at that one budget, uh, we, we have a balanced budget. Our problem is... Uh, as stated, with mandatory spending. Um, so what we have, though, is many proposals to add to our mandatory spending, uh, such as Medicare for All, which has a $32 trillion estimate cost over the next 10 years. So Dr. Taylor, I'll ask you, I'll start with you. In your opinion, how do you think the government would have to finance this program, uh, and how high would taxes have to be raised to meet such a large level of additional mandatory spending. I think if it's just an addition, it's not going to work. You have to do the other direction. The, the, the simulations, the calculations, as you say, this mandatory spending is going very rapidly. Um, it's got to be controlled. You don't have to reduction, reduce it. You have to sh slow the growth compared to growth of GDP. There's proposals out to do that. I think there'll be more, more discussion of those proposals would be very worthwhile. Much, much of the discussions go into the opposite direction, uh, Green New Deal, et cetera, Medicare for All. I haven't seen those where they're really saving money. I know there's some people that argued it would be, but, but there really has to be some uh, uh, attention given to this. I would like the projections, at least, are explosions of spending. It's largely, largely because of the so-called entitlement right. program. Has there ever been a country that you can think of in history that has spent its way into prosperity and increased taxes in order to pay for more government-run programs? I think the, the history is quite clear that uh, a solid fiscal policy where you're, you're balancing the budget as close as possible over the cycle, you have deficits in recessions and slumps, you have even surpluses sometimes, and Good times, it works pretty well. It's worked well for the United States. When we got off of that, it has not worked very well. So that should be the goal. We're a long way for that now, but some of the reforms that would go in that direction. Uh, I would actually encourage uh, you to use CBO. Why doesn't CBO have a, have a model that a, a, a answers the questions about the short run and the long run? Much of the debates and the focus is, oh, you can't re even reduce the growth of spending because it's going to be hit to the economy. I don't believe that's the case. I think you can, and reasonable calculations and models show that it's a benefit. So I, I would encourage that part, maybe deals with some of the partisanship that we're seeing already. Yes, agreed. I um, uh, want to ask you this then. The tax cuts that took place are being debated. They're saying they, they were not helpful, and clearly we have an unbelievably booming economy, and are being compared to the shovel-ready stimulus program from 10 years ago, which uh, was uh, 
the data shows was relatively useless um, and a waste. Uh, can you just comment on, on the historical results that come from tax cuts, putting money in people's pockets and gaining the multiplier effect versus the federal government thinks it knows best with people's money and uh, on, on projects that um, are so-called shovel-ready and are, 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 are presented based upon um, uh, very often who knows who, and, and w which, is, which is also a symptom of a socialist government. Well, thank you very much. I've, I've written a lot on the stimulus packages, uh, both in 2008 and, and later, the uh, stimulus packages with President Obama. I don't think they had the impact that some people do. I think it actually was negative in many respects. Uh, the, the states didn't spend the money as they thought they would. They pocketed the money. Uh, a lot of it was transfers. It, it really didn't work very well. I mean, I have lots of studies that show that's the case. I also am on the record for showing and arguing that the 2017 tax reduction reform was beneficial. And it's not just the 35 to 21 percent. It's a lower rate on small businesses. It's expensing of investment. It's the kind of things that we know, at least in our theories, and I think it's true in reality, that more investment, more tools, better tools, better things that workers have to work with, they're going to be more productive and their wages will go. That's the idea. And that's what's built into the CBO long-term calculations that I referred to before. So I, I don't think economics has changed. I think it's, it's basically working quite well. We can see anomalies like the low interest rates that we've seen, but negative interest rates around the world. But basic economic forces are, are still working very well, and I think we need to emphasize those.